Sunday of Lent. Uh, the deadline to place your fish fry order is today at noon. Deadline to order Easter candy and Easter flowers is today, March the 14th. Extra order forms can be found on the table in the back of church. Special remembrance at this Mass has been requested for the celebration of Claire Chavannes' birthday. Our entrance in is number 40, Lord who throughout these 40 days. set all his palaces of fire, 
and destroyed all its precious objects. Those who escaped the sword were carried captive to Babylon, where they became servants of the king of the Chaldeans and his sons, until the kingdom of the Persians came to power. All this was to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, until the land has received its lost Sabbaths, during all the time it lies waste, it shall have rest while seventy years are fulfilled. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the words of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord inspired King Cyrus of Persia to issue this proclamation throughout his kingdom, both by word of mouth and in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me, and he has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever therefore among you belongs to any part of his people, let him go up, and may his God be with him. The word of the Lord. A response, let my tongue be silenced if I ever forget you. Let my tongue be silenced if I ever forget you. By the streams of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. On the aspens of that land we hung up our hearts. Let my tongue be silenced if I ever forget you. For there our captors asked of us the lyrics of our songs. And our despoilers urge us to be joyous. Sing for us the songs of Zion. Let my tongue be silence if I ever forget. How could we sing a song of the Lord in a foreign land? If I were dead in Jerusalem, may my right hand be forgotten. Let my tongue be silence if I ever forget. May my tongue cleave to my palate. If I remember you not, if I place not Jerusalem ahead of my joy, then my tongue be silence if I ever forget it. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. By grace you have been saved, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from you, it is a gift of God. It is not from works, so no one may boast. For we are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God has prepared in advance, that we should live in them. The word of the Lord. So that everyone who believes in him may not perish, 
may have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people prefer darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light, so that his works may not be exposed. But whoever lives in the truth comes to the light, so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. points to part of this gospel that we are so familiar with. When we think of this point in Lent, where we have been led following our Lord in his gospels, about his first is confrontation and defeat of the devil in the desert when he went to be tempted by him and to reject those temptations. We know that last week too, we followed as he would be first transfigured the week before but then humbly went before, again, back to his normal state, I guess to say it was not so transfigured, not so brilliant, not so revelatory, but he went back to being rejected and misunderstood and humble before the people he was coming to save. Recall that his cleansing of the temple and his prediction that he would be the one to replace the need for sacrifice, and he would be the new place, the land of sacrifice, the temple and the altar itself, along with being the high priest. And now we are for a bit in this gospel, returning to the desert, as our Lord points out an important moment in the history of the Jewish people, the remembrance that those who were suffering the effects of poison were able to look at a seraph servant that was created mounted on the pole and instructed by Moses to be lifted up so that when people looked upon this image of the servant, they would be healed. He likens this to what, again, is an illusion to what he would go on to do. His passion, his suffering, the way our Lord would be lifted up so that people who were under the curse and poison of sin could be free and liberated. He's pointing towards this as a means of forgiveness and our entry into eternal life. And our Lord points out when he explains the meaning of divine love, how much of a weight beautiful word it is. That our Lord isn't coming with a judgment that puts an end to us because of our sin, but gives us a new beginning, allowing us then to go beyond what we had even before the fall and the first sin, to become sons and daughters of God. The promise of an eternal life in heaven in union with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he acknowledges the state of humanity, that they are in need, they are in trouble, that it isn't about so much further individual sins that would happen or the confusions of his nature, but that there's an effect to sin, which ultimately brings about death in man, that is his true target the true thing to heal, to give victory over, to conquer the devil and his brief success with mankind. Makes it clear that it's not just a simple matter of saying that we love, but he offers a definition. We can sometimes hear the people 
will try to pare away legitimate moral teachings of our Lord and the Church and this day and throw in our face while Jesus just said to love our friend. We did. Well, he said a lot more. And he did not mean when he asked that we would love our Father in Heaven with everything we have and our brothers and sisters as well. That it was letting us off easy. And I think when we think of the word love, the virtue of charity, this gospel explains it so beautifully. It prepares us for another Easter celebration when we hear the simple proclamation often in our lives that God is love. His love isn't like an emotion. It's not that feeling that we can have towards someone or even a thing that we want to be around. The kind of divine love isn't on a Hallmark card necessarily. It isn't something that comes and goes or as ebbs and flows like an emotional type of love. Divine love goes far deep. It comes from the will, his divine will, our human will, our ability to love and desire the very best for another person, for their own sake, for their own good. That's how we can love an enemy. It's not about liking them or being at all okay with some offense that they given us, but yet we should desire that they do and are better, that they be healed, and that they be close to God, for this is what we all need. It's the love that we have hopefully for ourselves that has been illuminated by God. He is to be lifted up, not as an image like the bronze serpent, but our Lord's love would be expressed by his being lifted up on the Holy Cross. That we would witness and recall it and keep it in the center of our churches and homes, reminding ourselves of what divine love and that holy charity really looks like. It can be made. It can make us a bit vulnerable when we desire the good for another, particularly when they be wrapped in the effects of sin. But our Lord is crucified while trying to liberate those who have sinned against Him. He's crucified because of sin and for the forgiveness of sin at the very same time. There is no more need for an additional traditional offerings because He would make this perfect sacrifice and offer a perfect teaching again about the meaning of divine love. In the end, he points it out as darkness and light, a very clear image in our minds, that the sins that we commit don't just stay confined onto ourselves. They do, they distort our soul, they stand in the way of divine life in this lifetime and can prevent our eternal life in God but that's not all. They do. The wrongs that we do can permeate the world, create an atmosphere that needs to be healed along with the individual souls that cause the sins. And this is why our Lord is held up. This is why He's an example to the world and a reminder that they are not trapped under the yoke of sin and death because of what He has done and offered to the world. It's a moment of great confidence to be loved, that kind of love, by our Lord, who is constantly willing the very best for his children. Everyone can come to this, and hopefully be soon, as we see and better understand, perhaps, the corruption and trials in our own life and in the world, as seen as part of the darkness that our Lord speaks of. For these sins that we cause and the strife that we can create around us by sin do not exist in the world that is close to God, that kingdom of God that He is preparing us for. And we latch onto that as example and inspiration to love and obey that is sacrificial because it's really united to Him in that ultimate sacrifice.
ice and lakes that are provided for us. We have to bring our troubles before our Lord and remember what that means. Our Lord did not put an end to the effects of sin in this lifetime. There's no greater example than that of them him suffering and dying on the cross because of our sins. But he means that they do not have the last word or anything close. Because we stand to walk in the light, to be illuminated by that love of this lifetime, and remain attached to him to get from this life to the next. To recognize the blessings that we receive in this life are his gifts to us. It resembles more of what he has created us to live out being in that divine image. And then, when we are confronted with the challenge to that love and goodness, be it by our own fault or an injustice or pain inflicted upon us by something beyond our control, we see it as a darkness that is still able to be overcome, even if it be as dark and as sad as the valley of death. That is what God and Christ and His love has conquered. So we stand in that light today, reconciling our lives again with the meaning of this Lent and Easter season that we're preparing. That it wasn't just a historical moment, but each day becomes a reality and something that our life revolves around. This sacred knowledge of being loved by God. The God who has built us into existence. That God has willed us to be saved even when we turn away from Him, and that God who has won all victories in the ultimate one for us. It gives us the grace to live out that call in joy and hope each day. Remember this Mass, we 
pray to the Lord. Father, we entrust our prayers to you in the holy name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. He took the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, 
and once more giving the thanks, handed the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter into my room. But I will say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
illuminate our hearts with the great and the splendor of your grace, that we may always ponder what is worthy and pleasing to your majesty, and love you in all sincerity. Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Two things of note. Um, one is this Friday is the solemnity of St. Joseph, and his feast day is the universal patron of the church and a protector of the church. I ask you if you can help our community here by offering uh, an important prayer through his intercession. I want him to help us um, sort out the repair and fixing of our roof. Um, and he knows a few things about buildings, so we can certainly use his prayers and intercessions as we continue that project. And um, secondly, thinking of the, the church itself, an interesting milestone uh, is that our organ turned 222 years old last Wednesday, and it was at least dedicated that long ago. Uh, there are very few instruments of its age and life that are still operational and in use, so we will continue to work to make sure it's still sounding and beautiful for many years to come. So, see there, it sounds pretty, pretty good for 222, doesn't it? So, uh, but thank you. Uh, again, just uh, so many blessings of being in this parish. So everywhere you turn, there's a new corner of history, another story, or even legends behind uh, the various things here. So I thank you for all your encouragement and help as we continue to take care of this beautiful parish that we can hand it on to another grateful generation after us. The Lord be with you. And with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father. Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth the Mass of Heaven. Thanks be to God. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God be with you and we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, compassionate and thou Satan, and all evil spirits, prowl about the world, seeking the rule of the soul. Please join me in singing our recessional hymn, number 46, O God.